Good day, everybody. My name is Dr. Leon Perman in New York City. Uh, I'm at Columbia University, and I want to welcome you to this Digital Financial Services Observatory webinar. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Ivo Jenik from CGAP. Uh, he's going to talk about regulatory sandboxes, lessons learned, and challenges ahead. And before we do that, uh, just some housekeeping notes. As I said before, please switch off your microphone and video so that we don't get uh, feedback and we disturb the, the speaker. Uh, please don't ask any questions by audio at any time. If you want to uh, key up any questions, please um, contact the host. You'll see it under the name there, Jason Backwrights, not admin. Jason Backwrights is the host, so you can uh, send questions in the, in, the, um, in the chat box during the course of the, the webinar, and they'll be asked at the end of the presentation. So today's agenda, it's a one-hour webinar, uh, just this quick DFSO introduction, then 15 minutes of webinar, and then about 15 minutes of written Q&A. Again, Q&A via WebEx chat box only. So um, this is the webinar team. Uh, we, we're acting under um, altered circumstances today because Columbia University uh, is closed and for the most part because of um, health issues which are affecting uh, many around the world. Um, this is a team, Professor Eli Noam, he's the director of uh, CITI, Columbia Institute for Information. That's me on the top right. Um, and there's Michael Weschler, Jason Buckwright, Keith Bowery, and Sam, Sam Scarito, uh, who's um, a research uh, staff. A bit about the observatory. Um, it's a project of the Columbia Institute for Teleinformation, CITI. We've been around since um, early 2016, financed by the um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Please go to our website. There's a lot of rich information there, dfsobservatory.com. Uh, you can actually watch now. I will put up the video archive of the 7th Digital Finance Summit, which was held uh, last month. And there's a lot of other videos, previous webinars, uh, previous summits, previous roundtables, lots of publications, a huge legal regulatory uh, news database, which is um, uh, entirely searchable, um, and um, a lot of other uh, uh, DFS and uh, related uh, resources. So activities. Just to get a flavor from our website, legal and regulatory database, model laws and regulations, webinars, roundtables, commentaries and analysis of new laws and regulations. We have um, uh, one of, if not the top, legal and regulatory database on digital financial services, blockchain, uh, cybersecurity, and some papers on sandboxes and, uh, and the like. Um, these are a sample of our um, activities events and webinars. Again, you can go to our online archive on dfsobservatory.com and view the, um, the video archive and, um, and, and various, various other resources. So a little bit about the uh, speaker today. Uh, uh, Ivo Jenik is a financial services specialist at CGAP, and Ivo is probably one of, if not one of the world's uh, uh, top experts on sandboxes. He's a sandbox Superstar. Um, Ibo has 10 years of experience in finance, primarily in retail finance services regulation. He led CGAP's work on regulatory innovation and capacity building for policymakers across continents before joining CGAP. Ibo worked in the responsible finance access team at the World Bank. We specialize in financial consumer protection alternative dispute resolution. Ibo has a master's degree in law from Columbia uh, Law School in New York. Um, and a master's degree from the uh, uh, University of Prague. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to um, to, Ibo, um, uh, to to the presentation. Thank you, Leon, and hello, everybody. It's a uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, part of this webinar series. I must say that I've been a big fan of DFSO and their really rich resources, and I've been participating in many of those webinars. So I'm pretty excited about actually being now one of the speakers or, or, or on, on that uh, webinar series. So thanks, Leon and the FSO team for uh, 
this opportunity. I'm also very excited to see that there is uh, many people attending this webinar instead of buying a mask and toilet paper and, and pasta. So I really do appreciate that you your order of priority uh, puts Sandbox pretty, pretty upfront. So I hope I will not uh, let you down with my presentation where I would like to basically walk you through um, my and my colleagues' experience with regulatory sandboxes so far, and I should say that we started looking into them fairly fairly early in early 2016, so soon after the FCA in the UK launched their regulatory sandbox. And since then, we've worked with several regulators all around the world, helping them to set up their own regulatory sandbox or an alternative to a regulatory sandbox, to be honest. We've conducted a survey, a series of interviews. We did some uh, some uh, intensive desk research into seeing how those sandboxes work, but also what impact they have. And so I'd like to present uh, some early observations, lessons learned, and there are always challenges ahead, obviously. So I will mention some of those as, as well. So let me first start maybe with a context. Why we are talking about regulatory sandboxes uh, in the first place, and why we're talking about regulatory sandboxes now. In other words, what has happened that regulatory sandbox has become such a popular topic and tool that now we have around 60 plus regulatory sandboxes operating or in making all around the world. And I should say that it's obviously a confluence of several factors. Um, I, I will name some of them, and you know I'll be curious to hear your views uh, once we get to the Q&A session. Obviously, one reason has to do particularly with uh, the global financial crisis and the aftermath of it. Um, by that, I mean particularly the regulatory efforts to strengthen uh, the, the financial sector, make it more resilient, and the consequences of that, good and bad, including the concentration of markets in some areas, including... I would say departure of some institutions from certain customer segments, creating a space for, for competition or new entrants. Um, but it's also, and very importantly, the technological advancements that we've seen over the, next, over the past uh, 10 years or so, including data analytics, biometrics identification, cloud computing, distributed ledger technology, and all the, the words that you've been hearing for past uh, five or so years and also the change in consumer behavior. And by that, you know, again, I mean multiple things, but importantly, the increased confidence and, and use of technology in a, in a daily consumer interaction and experience. Uh, we see constant increase in smartphone penetration, increasing online connectivity. And so all of these factors created a, a, a momentum for innovation across the sectors and industries, and obviously in the financial industry as well. So what you see on this slide is, on the bottom of this slide, you know, the financial sector is experiencing new entrants coming and trying to challenge the incumbents, uh, a new technology driving financial innovation, uh, a globalization, obviously, which we are now experiencing the, the sort of a dark side of it with the coronavirus and its spread all around the world. Uh, and speaking of a virus, obviously also new new threats that come with the technology and use of uh, technology. And we've heard from previous webinars organized by DFSO a lot about cybersecurity and uh, cyber threats. So on one hand, uh, uh, a lot of opportunities. On the other hand, uh, also new threats and risks. And regulators have been quite intensely seeking ways to keep up, really, with what's happening at this new faster pace uh, because their traditional tools might have not really been fine-tuned for this new normal, if you will. And uh, not only that, they've been also constantly facing a, a pressures coming from other directions, including their constantly increasing mandate or expanding mandate. You know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, many regulators would be mostly focused on macro and micro uh, prudential stability. And, and to a certain degree also integrity, so protecting financial sector against money laundering and, and, and terrorist financing abuses. But since then, their mandate has expanded to cover issues around consumer protection. Again, global financial crisis is a, is a milestone in that regard. Um, 
many regulators have responsibility for financial inclusion as well. And now there is a lot of discussion about competition mandate, about pro-innovation mandate. So the responsibilities of regulators are really massively expanding as well, not all, always matched by, uh, by enough resources, both monetary, but also uh, else uh, such as human resources. And so regulators are in this position where they want to leverage the opportunities, want to address the risks, but they don't necessarily have a suitable toolkit to do so in a, in a timely manner. And so when regulatory sandbox emerged, I believe it really echoed throughout the world of regulators because they thought, you know, this might be a tool that we've been looking for. And uh, we'll get to the question whether this is really the case, case or not. Um, so regulators and regulation need, need to adapt, uh, need to adapt to the new uh, circumstances and to the new context. As I mentioned before, the rules for the financial sector where in many jurisdictions frame for, for this kind of game that you see on the, on the left side, so just a handful of uh, players very much looking alike and, and playing some sort of very analog desk board game. But what you see on the other side of the slide is the current reality of many different types of entities using highly or highly leveraging technology to deliver financial services, often very specialized, in terms of their value proposition, the segment they serve, and uh, the way they operate. And this is the reality to which regulators and regulation need to adapt. Uh, but obviously, that adaptation uh, capacity is restricted by many factors, be it the, what I already mentioned, the resources, for, for example, that are available, but also the flexibility of the existing legal and regulatory framework the political economy, the liability of regulators, their, their, um, their support by a broader stakeholder environment. And so in this context, regulatory sandboxes really uh, uh, resonated or have been resonate, resonating so far. Um, they are, however, not coming absolutely out of blue. They're rather a continuation of a process that started uh, quite some time ago. And uh, on this timeline that you should see on your screens, um, we've put the first mark in 2005 with uh, Philippines and their test and learn approach. And this is not to claim that this is where it all begins. You know, we would be able, obviously, to trace this further down the road. But um, it's quite significant, especially in the financial inclusion space, because test and learn approach, which is very similar conceptually to regulatory sandboxes, was applied in the Philippines to test e-money. Um, to test e-money as a new concept that then has become very popular, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, and has been a big driver in, in financial inclusion, which is uh, a topic that is particularly close to, to my uh, mother organization, obviously. So test and learn approach very briefly means that a regulator decides to test something new that is not covered by the existing legal and regulatory framework. Uh, typically, it decides to test it with either a single or a very narrow uh, set of players in a temporarily carved out framework that can be carved out through different means. Uh, very often it's through the non-objection letter issued to those testing firms. Once the test is um, accomplished and the time frame can be really different depending on what is being tested, then the regulator typically adopts a new set of rules to apply to that kind of business. And we've seen this replicated not only obviously in the Philippines, but Kenya, Tanzania, and many other markets as well. What you see on the timeline is not only the test and learn approach, but also other important changes in the regulatory environment, such as moving towards principle-based regulation, a regulation that is risk-based and proportionate to the risks posed by different players. And so this all created a, uh, an environment in which regulatory sandboxes could emerge in 2015. The first one to coin the term was obviously the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK, and uh, since then the, the term has, has gained popularity. Uh, so maybe for some of you, or perhaps for all of you, this might be uh, just stating what you already know, but I would like to, for the purpose of this, this webinar, define what we even mean by, by regulatory sandboxes. So. The, the definition that CGAP has been working with, which 
at a very high level applies probably to most of the sandboxes, although when you start looking into details, you realize that while sandboxes from the 35,000 feet uh, level look pretty much the same, at the very granular level, they are very different types of initiatives, but this definition would probably cover most of them. So regulatory sandbox is a formal regulatory initiative to test new product services or business models live in the marketplace with real clients. It's performed, the testing is performed on a time and scope limited basis. Um, and it's performed in order to determine the appropriate regulatory treatment or status, which means that there has to be some uncertainty about what kind of legal and regulatory requirements should apply on the innovation concerned. And this is all happening in a confined environment under the supervision of, of the regulator with the idea to conduct the test in a safe environment and once proven safe and the regulation identified, then it could be scaled up in the marketplace. Now, it's an important component of this definition to say what the regulatory sandbox uh, is, is not, uh, because sometimes there's a misperception about where is the boundary between regulatory sandbox and something else. So first of all, it's not a permanent license to operate. It's a temporary initiative. Uh, it's a temporary testing environment. It's not something that should be used for perpetuity. So it's not a specific license. Uh, it's not a free pass to operate without regulatory oversight or supervision. So it's not an entry door into the Wild West. And I'll get to that point later in my presentation. It is required when the regulatory status of an innovative product can be termed, can be determined without life testing in, uh, so sorry, it should not be required when the regulatory status of an innovative product can be determined without life testing in the marketplace. In other words, if there is an innovation, but this innovation can be licensed without experimental testing in sandbox, then it should be licensed right away and the sandbox is not necessary. And finally, it's not really a venue for testing the viability of new business models or attracting new customers. In other words, regulators should not spend their scarce resources only to allow innovators to test whether their idea is a good idea or a bad idea from the business point of view. For that purposes, there are private-based solutions such as incubators, accelerators, and um, they, they should be used in the first place. Uh, regulator is there for different, uh, different reasons. Now, the important question is, all right, so now we know what sandboxes are, but what they're really good for. We also understand why they emerge in the specific uh, context, but what they really do and how they really benefit um, the participants and stakeholders. So to answer that question, based on our hypothesis, we, we conducted, and I say we because it was a CGAP jointly with, uh, with our host organization, World Bank, we conducted this survey asking regulators uh, several questions about their innovation facilitators, including regulatory sandboxes. And one question was, uh, what services that, does your organization offer to providers accepted into regulatory sandbox? Because in a way, it's a proxy to, for us to estimate where the real value is. And the dominant answer was, we do provide guidance. We, we basically help uh, innovators and mostly startups to get themselves oriented in the regulatory space and help them to comply with the actual legal and regulatory requirements that apply to their business. So I'll get back to that in my in my later slides. Whether this is really um, whether this is really something that can be only delivered through sandboxes or whether there are alternatives. But it was definitely one of the key values. Um, mentioned by, by regulators themselves. There are obviously other benefits that are typically cited uh, with regards to Sandbox. One of them is lower cost of innovation. And this is something that's been particularly promoted by the FCA in, in the United Kingdom. They say that uh, through Sandbox, they've managed to save some of the costs that, would, uh, that startups would typically incur. Um, I put maybe here in the brackets because while it might well be true in, in the UK, I, I can't really tell that we've seen this impact in, in many other countries. Um, there is probably something around saving some of the costs for legal counsel, helping startups to apply for a license and comply with existing requirements. 
but I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a massive uh, cost saving that, that we see. More important, I think, is that it open access to the regulatory sandbox opens access to regulators. So it becomes easier for uh, for startups, especially to reach out to regulator and have an open, frank conversation about their business idea and how they can become a regulated entity. And uh, it's also obviously a formal framework for safe life testing, where if something goes wrong, the potential consequences are safeguarded to a limited scale of the testing. It also helps, and that's something that I'd like to emphasize particularly, it helps regulators to keep up with what's happening in the market. And uh, it's a learning tool effectively for regulators. And it's a learning tool that is relatively cheap because people come to you and tell you what's, what's in use instead of spending too, re too much resources on market-wide analysis and then assessment. And also often qu quoted or often cited uh, benefit is signaling regulatory sandbox signals openness of regulators uh, to deal with innovation and again I put maybe here because it only works when there is a genuine openness of regulators behind the sandbox to really deal with innovation in a new ways because I've seen regulatory sandboxes set up and signaling this openness but not really delivering on that promise because regulators were simply not willing or 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 ready or able due to their legal limitations to handle innovation in a flexible way. Now, whenever there are benefits, there are also risks, uh, as, as, as you know. So just to complement the picture, I will run through some of those risks, but very quickly. One risk is obviously that uh, regulators do not have a capacity to implement a regulatory sandbox. They don't have the resources, they don't have the commitment, they don't have the support of the management to really dedicate uh, their their attention to regulatory sandbox. And then it may be a big announcement of sandbox, but not really matched with um, with the sufficient impact and, and, and delivery. Uh, one point that has been quite widely uh, discussed in, I would say generally in media, is the competition issues. Uh, the notion that regulatory sandboxes may be uh, providing some competitive advantage to those firms that are lucky enough to test in the regulatory sandbox. And uh, frankly speaking, I, while I understand this point, I believe that if sandbox is done in a very transparent, uh, formalized, so to speak, uh, manner where every, everyone is clear on what the eligibility criteria are, or more generally, what the rules of game are, then I think the competition issue should not really be of, of concern. Uh, the, the last point here on this slide that I would like to mention is, and I already touched upon it, is the limited regulatory tools to implement sandbox. And I'll get back to this point, but just as a, as a sort of a heads up, it's very important to have a clear idea as a regulator, what's gonna happen before testing, throughout the testing, but also very importantly, after the test is, is accomplished. And again, we'll get back to this point later, but. What it means, for instance, is that if I test something that is really innovative and outside of my current legal and regulatory framework, I need to know what happens if the, the testing is successful. I, as a regulator, want now to see this innovation in my market scaled up, but I don't have a legal and regulatory framework yet in place to, uh, to deal with that innovation. Do I have a pathway for me as a regulator and for that innovator to operate in the marketplace uh, if in the absence of the regulation or in some sort of transitional uh, period. And this, this is uh, an important point to uh, discuss later. So now let me give you a quick overview of regulatory sandboxes all around the world. Um, so again, this is not a coronavirus map. This is uh, a map from the last year which captures uh, countries with a regulatory sandbox or a similar initiative, active, mark in green, or in, in, a, in the process, mark in red. Now, if we look at this map uh, today, many of the red countries would be already green, as, as you can imagine, or at least amber color, and there would be much more because I mentioned that um, currently there are 60 plus regulatory sandboxes or similar initiatives in, in making. And this trend obviously continues. Now, as I mentioned earlier, those sandboxes may be very different in detail, but 
at the very high level, they have a similar components that they are composed of or, or design elements that we can find across most of those sandboxes. And those design elements are basically six objectives, eligibility, safeguards, timing, cost, and post-test options. And I will touch upon some of those uh, as, as I go, and I will show you some numbers to, to give you a sense of uh, what they are and how they are being implemented uh, around the world. So let me start with objectives, uh, which is basically uh, the reason for setting up a sandbox. And again, the data that you see come from the World Bank CGAP survey uh, conducted uh, around six months ago. So we asked regulators, what's your motivation for setting up a regulatory sandbox? And uh, on the left side uh, of your screen, you should see that it was first of all just to catch up with innovation, just to see what's happening, learn about new stuff, um, and 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 uh, be basically up to date as a regulator. Then there was a desire to attract more inno innovators, and I'd like to emphasize this point because uh, this is very different motivation, um, or or this this motivation can be interpreted in different ways uh, across different jurisdictions. So, for instance, in the UK you know that regulatory sandbox and the whole innovate project was uh, has been driven by the desire to increase competition. But in the context where there already had been a lot of fintechs willing to test new ideas and willing to serve customers, not, not necessarily all of them willing to be regulated entities, but the FCA UK already saw a very vibrant fintech environment. But we see many countries where regulatory sandbox comes into play as part of the plan to actually create this vibrant environment and promote fintech as an industry. So it uh, could be interpreted uh, differently. Um, the number four reason re relates to the previous one, and it's, it's the desire to drive competition in the market. and goes to the point that I mentioned at the very beginning of my presentation. Many markets face a high concentration issue, and they are trying to bring more uh, more entrance to their market and sort of a shake up a little bit the existing incumbents. Uh, and, and so one way to do it is also through a regulatory sandbox or similar initiatives. What I marked on the, the right side of your slide, the competition, this is a mandate. So our initial hypothesis was that the motivation or the stated objectives for sandbox would match mandates of the implementing agencies. But we found that actually there's not so many agencies that do have a comp explicit competition mandate, yet they would still cite competition as one of the reasons for setting up a regulatory sandbox. And when prompted, we realized that many of those without competition mandate would still find a way to tie the competition in, in, in their broader mandate, often um, related to financial stability. So they would basically argue that even if we do not have a competition mandate explicitly, it's part of our stability mandate because more competitive markets are, are, are in the long run, healthier and, and, and uh, more stable. The second uh, component is eligibility. In other words, who can or cannot test in regulatory sandbox. And here we found that in most regulatory sandboxes, both existing authorized financial institutions, banks, insurance companies, investment companies op already operating in the market and startups are allowed to test in the regulatory sandbox, although there would be still countries where uh, it could be only uh, available to either startups or authorized institutions. When it comes to safeguards, that's a very interesting question because it basically uh, concerns what the sandbox firms can do while testing in the sandbox. Do they need to actually comply with some legal requirements or not at all? And so we again asked that question and um, we definitely realized that in regulatory sandboxes, many regulators do grant some exemptions and waivers to testing firms, which means that they, do not be, they don't need to be fully compliant with all sets of rules and requirements. But we've also realized that there is a lot of um, requirements and safeguards put in place to make sure that, first of all, integrity uh, of the financial sector is protected. So very often we find that AML CFT rules are not relaxed at all. And uh, the other safeguards often con uh, concern consumer protection. 
And the consumer protection safeguards have different forms. So disclosure, telling clients that they're being used as uh, sort of guinea pigs for the test, uh, limiting the number of clients that can be can participate in the test, compliance handling mechanisms, and, and others. Now, I will not talk really much about timing and costs. Uh, one point that I'd like to mention regarding timing, which has to do with how long you are allowed to test and whether you're allowed to apply for test at any time or whether you apply a cohort-based approach. Um, so these are two timing dimensions. I really don't want to talk about the cohorts versus on top. I, I think you know if anybody has questions, please um, raise it in the chat. But I'd like to mention the timing component. So there is a quite wide range um, that we see from three months to 24 months, roughly, around the world. Three months is the case of FC UK, who are able to test really fast, decide what the regulatory treatment should be, and graduate firms from the sandbox and move to a next cohort. Um, I found that in several civil law countries, the time frame is often longer. And it's longer because it factors in the potential need to change regulation. So it's not necessarily that the test itself should take 24 months. It can still take three, six months, uh, but the reminder of the period might be the temporary permission to operate in the market until the full suite of new rules that might be re required is adopted by a regulator. Cost is really about who pays for what, and oftentimes we see that there's no, no specific fee associated with sandboxes, and that uh, regulators basically bear their own costs and testing companies bear their own costs. Um, this is pretty much common practice. One thing that I'd like to pause on is the post-test option. So what really happens once the test is concluded? And it could be failure, and then the company is asked to make some tweaks and maybe come back to the sandbox or uh, to, to apply for a license, or it could be asked to actually cease and desist, so to speak, stop operating, uh, stop thinking about that innovation because it's really not a great innovation. Uh, the, the good scenario is that the, the test is successful, and now the firm can apply for a full license because the regulator already knows what kind of license is applicable to that specific uh, specific innovation. Or, as I mentioned, the regulator may need to uh, change the rules. And changing the rules, again, may mean many different things. It may mean just changing the interpretation of the existing rules without making any amendments. It may mean making amendments to, to tweak the existing rules in a way that is reflective of um, the innovation. And so you, we can imagine, for example, identification of customers now being allowed to be done remotely using a biometrics um, authentication, for example. Uh, or it may mean that regulators need to adapt a new set of rules, uh, for instance, for, let's say, some in some countries, equity crowdfunding is still not regulated, and, and regulatory sandbox test in theory could lead to a new set of regulations. And so um, we we saw that in our survey that many regulators actually acknowledge that sometimes regulation indeed stands in the way of innovation and needs to be needs to be changed. And so that's what they would typically do if they realize, okay there is something new, we haven't thought about it before, now we need to either change our rules and or, or come up with the new rules. So obviously, logically, the next step is um, to create that, that enabling uh, regulatory framework. And, and so we then try to realize or, uh, or ask how much this actually happens as a result of Sandbox. And frankly speaking, the, the jury is still out because based on our survey data, as you see on your screen, um, the numbers were quite high. We actually, you know, over 60% of our respondents said that they actually do change the regulation as a result of sandbox test. And so we're not, now trying to collect more data on examples and, uh, and how this process actually works. And so stay tuned. We'll be publishing something on that uh, hopefully relatively soon. But it seems like sandboxes in many countries are actually enabling regulators to be quicker in adopting new rules and adjusting to, to uh, innovation. So the last bit of my presentation, I'd like to spend on uh, impact. 
and uh, the question whether regulatory sandboxes have really lived to their potential and have had the impact that, uh, that uh, policymakers generally expect them to have. And for that, you know, uh, I, I've included uh, a, a couple of data that come both from the survey that I've already mentioned, but also it comes from a sweep that CGAP did. We literally uh, look at all the publicly available data that we could find from around 13 uh, regulatory sandboxes around the world concerning the firms and technology being tested in the regulatory sandbox. And so we got around 100 firms uh, in the sample and you will see some of the data on the, the screen. The purpose of this is obviously to, to at least have some quantitative uh, expression or evaluation of the sandbox impact. But also, you know, I was told that the more figures and graphs you have in your presentation, the the more your audience would think you are a real expert on on the topic. So, um, I felt the urge to to put a lot of lot of uh, graphs in my presentation. So the first question was, was the most popular innovation facilitator that regulators put in place? Because you know that. A regulatory sandbox is one, but you've probably heard the accelerators, innovation hubs, fintech offices, rec labs, and others. And uh, so we created some some buckets and 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 uh, our definitions, and we found that regulatory sandboxes and innovation hubs are by far the most popular uh, the most popular innovation facilitators out there for now. Now, with the caveat that you know they may go under different names. And they may go also under uh, different shapes. What we also found, and, and I think this is quite interesting, is that regulatory sandboxes serve fewer firms than accelerators and innovation hubs. So in other words, there is a much bigger flow to those other innovation facilitators than regulatory sandbox. And in a way, it's quite logical and, and, and uh, it makes sense when you think about the definition of sandbox as a tool to test innovation in the context of legal and regulatory uncertainty uh, where you don't quite know how this regulation should be uh, should be uh, addressed from the regulatory standpoint because very often innovation and innovators just come to the to the regulator and through the conversation they realize okay well so now we should be regulated as this kind of um, provider and we just need to tweak our processes to comply with a full suite of regulation. And that is enough. And if you remember what I mentioned earlier about the guidance being provided through the sandbox, we actually believe that you don't necessarily need a sandbox to provide a guidance. The FinTech office or innovation hub or innovation point would already do that trick and would help uh, many, many startups, actually, as you see on the gra graph, many more startups uh, and innovators to navigate through the regulatory environment without even setting up uh, a regulatory sandbox. Now, the other question that we, we asked uh, or looked at was, what kind of technology gets tested? So who are the beneficiaries technology-wise uh, from a regulatory sandbox? And we found that, you know, probably not surprisingly, and we did this uh, a year ago, so, you know, even more significant for that time, a blockchain and cryptocurrency related or crypto related uh, uh, technology, uh, technology that has to do with data analytics, uh, digital ID and biometrics, and, and then uh, a big group of other where we found, you know, all sorts of uh, new types of tech being, being tested, um, very often combined with blockchain or data analytics. Then we ask what kind of sectors do, do benefit from or where that innovation happens. And again, perhaps not surprisingly, 31% happens in the payment space. So there's been a lot of disruption, arguably, in the payment space. And a big part of that payments would be obviously around instant payments, but also around remittances, as you can imagine. Then it was followed by, uh, by asset management, uh, lending, and other. But you see on the left side, there's a big, big part of wholesale and infrastructure. So we found, and this this was very often related to blockchain and distributed technology, things around clearing and settlement, um, registries, credit bureaus, all of these would fall under this, this big category of wholesale and infrastructure innovation. 
this this is a so so what I showed you on the previous slide is the data from the sweep. So this is the hundred firms that we've analyzed in our in our work. This data is a little different. It's uh, from the survey, so it's a different sample and regulators being inquired about this. But you see that that still to a large degree, there is an overlap and undoubtedly payments and clearing and settlements are on the forefront uh, when it comes to beneficiaries from you know, or benefiting from innovation and innovation tested through regulatory sandbox or similar initiatives. Now, being a, a CGAP, obviously, we had to ask the question whether regulatory sandboxes do have positive impact on financial inclusion or not. And uh, we've established some internal criteria of what we consider inclusive or not. You know, obviously, we would A, consider inclusive all the innovations that are explicitly targeting low income, uh, low income customers or customers that are traditionally unserved or underserved. But we would also count in some of the innovations that may not necessarily be explicitly targeted at those customer segments, but are inherently valuable or bringing some inherent value to those customer segments. And from the 100 firm sample, we found that it was around 80-20 uh, split. Um, probably not surprising there's so many 80 20 splits in the nature that even here we found it uh, only 20 percent of innovations we could say were really clearly identifiable as pro inclusion innovation tested in the sandbox then we did a little little more generous uh estimate uh using some additional criteria saying basically well you know maybe not in the first wave, but if this innovation gets scaled up, ultimately we believe that people who are unserved and underserved will actually benefit. And then it expanded to something around 40, 60. Um, but this is not to suggest that fun, that uh, regulatory sandboxes are pointless tool or, or tool that is useless for advancing financial inclusion. This is more to suggest that it's a, it's a rather generic tool that is, and to promote innovation generally. And as we hope, some of that innovation may be actually relevant and may be highly relevant for advancing financial inclusion. Now, we also argue that regulators can make a deliberate choices and take um, design choices and take measures to make a sandbox particularly important or particularly uh, relevant to financial inclusion. This could be, for instance, through identifying certain areas where there are key barriers to financial inclusion, and those barriers could be addressed to innovation, let's say, remote identification of customers, and can design a sandbox that would promote that specific innovation in that specific area. So in our work, we talk about inclusion-themed or thematic sandboxes with inclusion as their priority. Uh, so this is entirely possible and would be probably a good choice for regulators who have financial inclusion mandate, consider financial inclusion their priority, and want to use innovation as a vehicle for advancing financial inclusion. But as I mentioned, this is this would require some very deliberate choices about what kind of sandbox should should be in, should be put in place and how it should be implemented. It doesn't have to be necessarily the type of generic sandbox that uh, we've seen in many markets. And in this context, I'd like to mention, this is my last point, that, um, that was I was very uh, pleased in a way to see that Financial Conduct Authority, their sixth cohort in Sandbox, is actually a thematic Sandbox. When you look at their announcement, you'll see that they are actually particularly looking for innovation in certain areas that they list. And one of those areas is uh, financial inclusion. So even in, in, in the UK, we now actually have a thematic sandbox focused on financial inclusion. So this is it for from me for now, and I'm really looking forward to to your questions. Okay, Ivo, thank you. That was fully comprehensive as expected, and I, you can see why CGAP are thought leaders in the sandbox space, and especially of course uh, Ivo, who's been um, doing this for for many years, um, and. Let me just say as well that uh, we are, have got a record number of participants on our webinar today. 
Um, so I think that speaks to uh, the interest in the subject. So uh, thank you everybody for participating. And again, if you are going to, if you do have questions, please please send it to the host. Uh, you'll see it uh, in, your, in the, the chat screen, Jason Buckfights. Just type in your question in the in the chat box, and it will come up. And we, during the course of the um, webinar, we do we have got a number of questions come through. Not surprisingly, but please start sending them now if you if you haven't. Um, Eva, we've got a question from Shelley Spencer who asks, have you seen the use of regulatory sandboxes when innovation is across sectors and regulatory ministries? Uh, I should give an example of Pago Solar, uh, Solar and Energy Solutions of the Financial Services component. So I think that speaks to uh, cross-sector, uh, cross-regulator uh, coordination. What to do in those circumstances? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I have not seen Pago Solar specifically, but I've seen many cross-sector innovations being tested or attempting to test in regulatory sandbox. And this is not surprising at all because in the current world, and going to my earlier slide, you know, fintech startups, particularly, they don't really care whether their innovation should be confined uh, in, in the mandate of a central bank or an insurance uh, regulator or whoever, they just come up with some innovation which very often combines financial services and products that traditionally fall into very distinct buckets but are now bundled in, in a hybrid value propositions and, and, and business models. And regulators are obviously struggling with this because you know either they all claim to be responsible for uh, regulating and supervising that innovation or the other way around, they actually claim not to be, and then you know it's it's a big problem for uh, for the innovators. So, and we've seen um, this in a different context of context uh, of countries where there are multiple regulatory sandboxes run by multiple agencies. In countries where only one agency is running a regulatory sandbox, in countries where some are and some are not, and this obviously adds some complexity and to a certain degree undermines the experience of innovators with the sandbox and with the regulatory environment. There's no magic advice uh, how to deal with that, but what we've been constantly advising regulators to, to strive to do is to, create, to really create a single point of entry for uh, innovators. So that they don't need to figure out, the innovators themselves don't need to figure out where to apply for sandbox testing or or which regulator is the, the right one, but instead having one single point of contact and then having some joint committee or whatever mechanism that works in that specific context to make sure that the regulators either identify the only one responsible for that innovation or work jointly and do a joint testing and uh you know it works in some countries it doesn't work in others it's uh it's very often a political economy issue uh you probably know that the global financial innovation network has been trying to bring this even to a more complex context of international cross-border testing because many fintechs are interested in testing their innovation in multiple markets um it hasn't been you know, it's been an interesting learning experience, but it hasn't really yielded, I would say, the expected outcomes yet. But I think there is a general realization that there is even more need for this inter-agency and inter-governmental coordination if the innovation um, is to happen and if innovators are to benefit from initiatives such as regulatory sandbox because they cannot really work in, in silos at all. Okay. Um, thank you. Well, we've got a ton of questions that have come through, so thank you uh, very much. Uh, quick question from Abdul Abil in Cairo, uh, and I'll paraphrase the question because it's written out uh, um, very long. Is essentially how do uh, regulators uh, organise their internal resources? Which departments, personnel should be in uh, the initial committees and the selection committee? Yeah, great question. And uh, I should say that uh, this is a question that we also did have, and uh, uh, we're still collecting data on this. So I would say there are generally two approaches, um, maybe three. One is that you have a really dedicated uh, unit that 
deals with regulatory sandbox in, in, and innovation as their primary uh, work objective, let's say. And this is the case of Monetary Authority of Singapore. This would be the case of FCA UK and probably some other, uh, some other regulators. Obviously, this means having enough resources to, to support a specific unit. It also means having a sufficient workload for that unit so that you know, they can really spend uh, most of their time dealing, dealing with innovation. So there are some prerequisites for, for this structure to make sense. The other approach is sort of spoke and, spoke and ho, hub, hub and spoke <laughs> uh, uh, model, sorry, uh, excuse my non-native English. Uh, where where we see that the unit, the sandbox unit is very small. It could be one person, it could be two, it could be three. But these people are then supported by the broader ecosystem within the agency. So let's say I'm responsible for receiving applications, handling them, deciding whether they should proceed further. And then I connect to a licensing department and I connect to regulatory department and I connect to, for instance, payments department if I need so. For and, 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 and tap into their expertise to support the sandbox uh, project. And this is probably a model that we see mostly, where there is a small unit in charge and then using the other, the, the other available expertise within the agency. Um, and, and then we obviously, uh, the, then we obviously see a, a variations of those. One of them would be sort of a cross-departmental committee that is in charge of regulatory sandbox. Uh, yeah, but maybe one one point on this, I would mention that you know the typical size that we found in our research so far of a sandbox unit is around three five people. Um, yeah, to that point, uh, for um, regulators with smaller uh, numbers or capacity or both. Uh, do you think thematic sandboxes would be the initial approach where they just concentrate on one uh, area of expertise that is available in the central bank or some other regulator? Yeah, I think so, Leon. I, I actually uh, like regulatory sandboxes uh, that are thematically focused because I think it allows generally regulator to manage resources better. Uh, first of all, it's easier, obviously, to predict what kind of innovation may be coming through the sandbox. If you have, for example, sandbox focused on um, fraud monitoring or, or remote identification of customers. Uh, so it helps regulators to build those internal resources before the sandbox is announced. But I think also importantly, it allows regulators to really focus the innovation power and momentum into the areas that are considered by the regulator most important for the market. So, so generally speaking, I'm a big, big fan of thematic sandboxes, to be honest. Um, okay, one quick question from Daniel O'Hara in Kampala. Um, are there, I'm paraphrasing a long question, um, are there rules for essentially kicking out people from a sandbox and what's the reputational impact of that? Yes, thank you, and, and greetings to Kampala. Uh, there, there have to be. Uh, there have to be because all things can go wrong when, when it comes to testing, and that's not only true for sandboxes, but generally, I guess, in life, experimentation comes with risks. So generally speaking, the, the rule is that if the innovation turns out to be uh, harmful, it's causing some issues to the customers, it's causing some, some issues in the market, you know, uh, a no-brainer. The the innovation should uh, the testing should stop, and the firm is asked to leave the sandbox. Obviously, any non-compliance with the safeguards and other restrictions uh, uh, applied on on the firm during testing can lead to uh, cease and desist uh, requirement. Again, uh, basically asking the firm to leave out, unless you know it's a, it's an issue that is not a big issue and can be solved by by some changes in the operations. So these would be the two major um, examples of when the testing can be actually interrupted and the firm can be asked to leave the sandbox. Okay, we've uh, got about five minutes remaining. Uh, so I'm going to squeeze in this bit of and stop talking. Uh, from <laughs> Professor Chris Werner from New York uh, University, that's by me. Uh, should there be a glow should there be global standards and best practices for sandbox used to the race to the bottom and promote a race to the top? 
Yeah, that's a <laughs> that's a great question, and uh, I I have not formed my personal views on on this yet. To be honest, you know that there is a, a European initiative where I believe the ECB is, uh, or maybe EBA, I'm not sure now, is trying to put some high-level standards and principles for uh, regulatory sandboxes and similar initiatives. Um, these would would be you know, really just high level uh, principles. And I think that's probably a reasonable approach because I think at a very high level, we can say what are to do's and not to do's. Um, and we're actually working at CGAP on uh, a guideline that would help to identify those to do's and not to do's. But um, it shouldn't be too detailed. It shouldn't be a, a standard in the in, in a true, true sense that would prescribe um, too much of um, requirements because my current view is at least such because I've seen regulatory sandboxes implemented in so many different ways reflective of the local context that I think once we start getting too granular in prescribing what is a good sandbox as compared to bad, we may lose some of that magic that happens when countries kind of take the blueprint from the UK, but tweak it in a way that really reflects their actual needs and their market and, and regulatory conditions. So in a way, I would say yes, at high level, I think it's a great idea, uh, but not too prescriptive, I guess. Uh, okay, in the similar vein, uh, uh, second, maybe final question from uh, Chris Land, I don't know where Chris is, but um, thanks, Chris, for your question. Uh, who asks about, uh, is it typical of most sandboxes to allow international linking or reciprocity with other jurisdictions? And I suppose that, that speaks to the passporting effect that uh, many regulators are planning. And I think it's been discussed through GFAT. Yeah, well, hi, Chris, wherever you are. Um, this is definitely aspirational, uh, and, and, and we... We've noticed that there is an increasing number of regional initiatives where regulators are trying to join forces and allow cross-border testing as a way to promote uh, their fintech operation. And again, it's not surprising because many fintechs with relatively narrow value proposition see a way to scale up, not necessarily vertically by offering new and, 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 and sort of more services and cross-selling and upselling their, their clients, but rather scale up horizontally across multiple markets. And so the demand for this level of cross-border testing, cross-border coordination is there. And we see you know, experiments with that. Again, GFIN is probably the most complex experiment in that space so far. Uh, but I can't really tell you whether it's been successful or not. I haven't seen much of this actually happening because the, the barriers and challenges are incredibly complex. Uh, and even things such as a joint testing across borders and then some sort of a facilitated streamlined licensing process across multiple jurisdictions is already complex because even if at high level, the requirements applic applicable to any concerned in innovator might be very similar, very often when you start going more granular and seeing the differences in the legal and regulatory requirements, uh, you find a big, big differences effectively, and that inhibits uh, that streamlined process because now you need to really negotiate individually with individual regulators uh, what should be applied or not. And uh, so I, I, I am confident that we will see uh, really effective cross-border regulatory sandboxes at some point. But I think we are not there yet, and will take probably some more time. And this is maybe where. The, the some international standards can help that process. Yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm aware of uh, discussions between uh, Pakistan, some Pakistani regulators and those in the Middle East on passporting, but as you said, that's early days because of the uh, differences in regulation and the regulatory uh, philosophies, um, functional versus uh, uh, rules and there are bilateral fintech bridges, but even the fintech bridges, you know, have not been that a big success either for the same reasons of the regulatory differences between countries. Okay. Um, uh, uh, usually we end on the dot, but if we could squeeze in one more question. 
these, um, at, uh, I'll paraphrase this from Jackson Mueller from um, Milken Institute. Uh, have you documented how the information gleaned from the sandbox processes uh, and makes its way to a regulator towards new regulations or guidances? Yes, uh, hi, Jackson. Uh, you're probably a couple blocks away from me. So uh, this is uh, this is currently our, our uh, where we've been interviewing a number of regulators who claim to have uh, Sandbox as a way to also inform that regulatory process. And uh, so what I can say for now is that there is uh, a usually some committee established which is focused on a regulatory change and that is involved in uh, defining the testing and participating in the testing and then extracting the, the insights from testing as part of the regulatory uh, change process but so far uh, I haven't really heard that sandbox would be the only input it's just the regulator decides to change some rules or come up with the regulatory framework for some innovation and uses sandbox as a one way to seek input into that process in addition to you know the desk research stakeholder consultation and everything beyond and and, and sandbox provides that tangible evidence of how it could work in their specific mar market so um as part of our plan uh for the remainder of the year is to finish the series of interviews that we've been conducting and uh and publish the insights from that. And this should be one of the insights uh, included in our publication. Excellent. Um, we do have a number of questions. Carlos in uh, Mozambique, uh, uh, Carolyn, Talha, uh, and a number of others who've sent questions. I'm sorry we can't address them. I'll pass them on um, uh, to Ivo, or we'll pass on these details. But to say, uh, that this webinar will be uh, placed online in a few days on the DFSO um, archive. There was a lot of rich data on the slide, so you can pick up uh, the, the uh, recording online in, um, probably by the end of the week. Make it as uh, available as soon as possible. There have been a number of questions about that. But, uh, Ivo, we've had, a, as I said, a, a record number of people uh, participating today, and it speaks to uh, the richness of, of, of the data. Uh, that you and your team at TGAP have, um, have accumulated, and, your, and thank you for your thought leadership. And just to say that uh, we, we always uh, work well with CGAP and we would like to continue the relationship. It's a great partnership. Um, so Same now we're us. ending about three minutes uh, um, after we normally do. Um, but thank you again, wherever you are in the world. Have a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, until next time. Bye-bye from New York City.